taking you to a familiar passage of scripture, Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew chapter number 27, we're reading the first five verses. Matthew 27, here beginneth the reading of God's word. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Verse three, then Judas Iscariot, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said to him, so what is it to us? You take care of that business. Then he threw down the, the 30 pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. He threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. And our subject tonight is living without regret. Regret. Judas was so regretful, so remorseful of what he had done, which tells me that he loved the Lord, right? He loved the Lord, but he was so regretful of what he had done, so remorseful that he killed himself. I hope that never happens to anyone here. So I have a couple of questions for us before, as we as we get started. Do you have any deep regrets that you wish you could get a do-over on? I know I have a few. Maybe it was something you did that was painful or deceitful or harmful to mm -hmm. a friend or loved one. Oh, yes. How about something you did not do when you had the chance and now <laughs> you look back with regret saying, wow, if I if I could do again, <laughs> I, would have, I would have liked to have done that or I would have liked to finish college or I would have liked to have gone further in school or mm -hmm. amen. But for our brother Judas, he was tricked. He was deceived. 30 silver coins, Judas betrayed Christ. And when he received his payment and saw that <laughs> Jesus was condemned to be executed because of his actions, the Bible tells us that he became remorseful. He was regretful of what he had done. And so he killed himself. On or about that same time, interestingly enough, we read the account of Peter denying Jesus before the crucifixion. Uh, if you read Matthew 26, 33, first Peter confidently says, quote, if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble, he said. But yet that very night, Peter denied him three times, three separate times. And the Bible says that he went out and wept bitterly, Matthew 26, 75. Here we see that both Peter, Peter made a promise and he broke that promise and was sorrowful. He had made a pledge that he couldn't keep and then he experienced the deep regret because of it. And then just like Judas, Peter betrayed the son of God. And his regret is clearly seen in the text that we just read because the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. However, in John 21, 15, we see that the Lord restores Peter to his former place and Peter experienced restoration and forgiveness and was invited once again to follow the Lord. And I'll read that for you. It is taken uh, from uh, John 21. I'll read verse 15 through 19. So when he had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said to him, yea, Lord, you know that I love you, man. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said to him, yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. 
And then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? At this point, Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, listen, man, you know all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And then Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto you, when thou wast young and girdest yourself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when you shall become old, thou shalt stretch forth your hands and another shall guide thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death that he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto Peter, follow me. So that was Peter's restoration to fellowship. So I want you to be thinking in your mind now, both Peter and Judas, both, both of them uh, turned their backs on God, if you will. Peter denied him three times in one night. And Judas sold him out, sold him out to the man, so to speak. Uh, Peter's restoration was because of his decision to repent, right? Even though he broke his promise to the Lord, his repentance was, was genuine. And the Lord accepted his change of heart and, and then invited him back into fellowship. And in 2 Corinthians 7 and 10, we read that, quote, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Let me read that again. So there's two types. There's godly sorrow, which produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death, right? Two types of sorrow, worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. These two stories of Peter and Judas are very clear examples of the difference between the focus of our presentation tonight, godly sorrow and just saying, I'm sorry, what I call worldly sorrow. One man's sorrow led to his death, Judas. The other man's sorrow led to salvation and life, Peter. That is the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow, life and death. The truth is, regrets can be beneficial if they lead to true repentance. And when they do, we must understand that God stands ready to forgive us of our sins. And it is his desire that we, we move forward, we move on with our relationship with him. The Lord knew that Peter's calling and ministry was bigger than the mistake that he had made of denying Christ. However, he had to come to that acknowledgement himself and honestly and truly repent, which, which led to his second call to follow the Lord. And this teaches me that when I make a mistake, <laughs> the door of repentance and restoration is still open that I can return to the Lord and make right what I had done and be restored. That's what repentance is all about. Uh, for those of us who served in the military, it is it is a military term that means about face. Godly sorrow brings repentance and lead to salvation. Uh, it doesn't leave any room for regrets. But worldly sorrow, on the other hand, is like that of a of a, of a criminal getting caught for breaking the law and and is made to to pay for it, to be punished for it. They may be sorry they got caught and regretful that they're going to be punished and maybe even go to prison. But it doesn't lead them to repentance or change of behavior. When he or she gets out of prison, they often return to their, their, their criminal ways. With worldly sorrow, a person may admit an act of wrongdoing without being truly sorrow for it. Uh, it's very different from repentance. Worldly sorrow is more concerned with avoiding the consequences of wrongdoing or the mistakes that we've made. With, with worldly sorrow, the sinner may try to hide his guilt. And if his sin is exposed or his mistake is exposed, instead of changing behavior, they may get angry and defensive and start to blame others. 
Does that sound like something you've heard or seen? I hope so, because I've seen it a lot. When a person, instead of uh, accepting that they made a mistake and then asking for forgiveness and changing their behavior, they become immediately defensive. Judas Iscariot experienced a similar regret, but but no repentance. We saw the Bible tells us that he went out and hanged himself. And so this tells us that regret and repentance are two different things. Regret is wishing something had never happened. Okay, I wish it never happened. But repentance is taking action to prevent that something from happening again. Regret leads to remorse, but only repentance leads to change. So let me be clear. All of us have regrets. Every last one of us. If there is a thing that prevents us from reaching our glorious destiny in, in, in the purpose of the Lord, it is regret. The word regret, in fact, is defined as sorrow or grieving or distress over, watch this, a desire unfulfilled or an action performed or not performed. An unfulfilled desire or something that we did or didn't do. So we all have regrets. And none of us is perfect. Let me just make that clear. There, there are mm -hmm. actions we try to bury, but they keep coming back to torment us. Amen. And regrets can regrets can confine us in the past. It can also can consume our present. We can't move forward. And, and, and as a result, it can incapacitate or even decapitate our future. Regret is no joke. If you live in a state of regret, it can destroy your future. It can halt your progress. It, it can be a prison for you, but you are your own jailer. Regret leave us questioning our decisions, our judgment, and even our character. Uh, regret typically occurs in two ways. We regret the things we did, and we regret the things that we didn't do. Our lives are often filled with woulda, shoulda, coulda scenarios, right? You know, the things that we would have been or we should have done or could have been all because we didn't do it when we had the chance. I have one big regret. When I was uh, graduating from, from, from my undergraduate training, all of my peers, all of my schoolmates, we were all sort of adult students, right? We were not you know, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, we were, we were in our thirties. Um, and, and my big regret was that I didn't immediately go on to do higher studies the way that I, that I had planned. I wanted to do an MBA. I wanted to go beyond that. And, and so I settled for a certificate program after my bachelor's, as opposed to a master's degree or an MBA, like I had planned. Bethany was just, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not even one. I don't remember. Um, and Venice and I were in family mode. And I was like, I can't, I, I can't commit another two years full time to school. Oh, okay. You know, and, and so I said, you know, let me, let me just pause. Let me just pause. And then I will finish my MBA later on. Uh, it never happened. I did a master's uh, certificate program, and, and that was it. And I tried several times, even some days now, I think, you know, maybe I'll just go back and do an MBA. Not so much that the degree would, would cause me to get a job of some kind, but it was, a, it was something that I had uh, planned for myself, my, my own desire. That is a regret that I have. But I've since moved on. I don't. I don't live back there. I don't let it hinder my future, you know? And, and I want you all to be thinking about that tonight as we teach. Um, I was reading a little excerpt of an autobiography of, um, of Billy Graham. Um, Billy Graham is a big presence here in Charlotte, North Carolina. In his autobiography, Just As I Am, Billy Graham talks about a conversation that he had with President John Kennedy uh, shortly after his election. 
and he writes in his in his memoir on the day on the way back to the Kennedy House, uh, the president elect stopped the car and turned to me and said, "Do you believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ?" This is President Kennedy talking to Billy Graham, the evangelist. And Billy Graham responded, I, I most certainly do. So the president says, well, does my church believe in it? And remember, he was Catholic, right? He said they have their creeds and they, they don't preach it. He said they don't even tell us much about it. And so the president says, I'd like to know what you think, Billy. So I explained, Billy said, what the Bible said about Christ coming the first time, dying on the cross, raising from the dead and then promising that he would come back again. And he said, only then are we going to have peace on earth when the Lord returns. The president says, very interesting, looking away. Well, we need to have another talk about that someday, he said. And he continued to drive on. Billy Graham wrote in his memoirs, several years later, the two of us met again at the 1963 National Prayer Breakfast. At that time, I had the flu, Graham remembers. And after I gave my short talk and, and the president gave his short talk, we walked out of the hotel together. Uh, as was always our custom at the curb, he turned to me and said, uh, Billy, could you ride back to me to the, with, to the White House? I'd like to talk with you for a minute. Billy Graham recounted that he said, well, Mr. President, I have a fever. He protested, not only am I weak, I, I, I don't want to give you what I have. I don't want to give you this thing. Uh, couldn't we wait and talk another time? Uh, it was cold, he said. It was a snowy day and I was freezing. And as I stood there without my overcoat, of course, the president graciously said, of course, Billy, we can do this another time. But they would never meet again. You know the you know the st the end of that story. Later that year, Kennedy was shot dead. Billy Graham commented his hesitation at the car door, and his request of me haunts me still. What was on his mind? He wrote, "Should I have gone with him? It was a moment that I could not recover, an irrecoverable moment." He writes. You can buy that book just as I am. It's probably available on Amazon or whatever. But you can tell from Billy Graham's comment that he regretted that lost opportunity, that lost moment to tell the president about salvation in, in a real and meaningful way. Life is so filled with, with, with many if I had known comments, you know? I sometimes say, if I knew then what I know now, you know, something like that. For example, if I had bought Apple stock at $22 a share when they IPO'd in 1980, right? I'd be a millionaire today. You know what I mean? If I if I if you'd purchase just ten thousand dollars worth of Apple stock, it would be worth sixty-seven million dollars today. I know <laughs> if I had known, right? I'm going to talk to you about that, brother. <laughs> Perhaps you regret a decision you did not make or maybe a decision you did make in haste. Or maybe like Billy Graham, it was an opportunity lost. Perhaps right now you're studying the wrong course of action. Or, or you wanted to go back to school and you didn't. You're not studying at all. Maybe you regret a word spoken out of turn or a word not spoken. Perhaps you were in a relationship that ended badly. And now you're regretting what you could have done to make it right. Maybe you regret a job offer you did not take or, or a better job you left for the present one and you don't like this one so much. Right. Perhaps it's a it's a message or a phone call in the moment of anger and you responded regrettably. Maybe you regret not being bolder at a time when you needed to be. Perhaps because you said something that hurt a relationship. 
Maybe you regret not saying yes to a good partner that would have been ideal for marriage. And now it's only the knuckleheads that keep calling you. You know what I mean? I'm 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 tickling you, of course. I'm pushing you, but you know, we 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 regret so much. Sometimes it's not spending enough time with your family. You regret the opportunities you miss with your family, your kids, your spouse. Maybe you married and you think the wrong person. You see, regrets come in many, many packages and in many ways. And every one of us has missed opportunities. But God is saying to you today, ah, yes, I can restore the seasons. I can restore the times. I can restore the missed opportunities in the years that you've lost. Things have not gone that far where I can't restore it is what God is saying. God has new opportunities for each and every one of us. Don't let the lost opportunities make you feel discouraged for too long. Uh, listen to Joel 2.25. Uh, this is the, the, prophet, the prophet that the Lord had given the original vision of the Holy Ghost coming. And he said in Joel 2 and 25, quote, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. I will restore to you what the canker worm and the caterpillar and the pommel worm have taken. He refers to them as his great army, which he sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty when it has been restored and you will be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord, your God, ah, that he has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Verse 27, and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord, your God and none else my people shall never be ashamed of me. God, God never forces man to choose. We have been given the freedom of choice, the ability to choose our own God. It is our responsibility. Whatever or wherever, you are the product of the choices you made yesterday. Whatever you are today, you are the product of the choices you made before. The power to choose is a choice we make every day. To choose is to decide. And decision is the power and privilege of a free society. It is to select the best alternative. Choices indicate uh, there are options. You have a choice today to change your present situation and focus on the future. I'll tell you another personal story. When, when Venice and I got married 30 years ago now almost, we lived in my mom's basement. To save money, to put our kids in a better school district, to get out of the Bronx, there are many reasons. But we wanted to secure our future and it meant that we had to make tough choices in the moment. Yeah, I had a good job and she had a good job. We could have found our own apartment and paid the rent and took, you know, 15 years to buy a house and whatever. But we decided it was a choice. We decided that for now, let's live here. Let's save our money so that we can buy our own home. The changes we make does not come to us on its own. It's motivated by the decisions you make. Your choices will definitely make or shape your future. Your tomorrow will be determined by the choices you make today. The choices you make will make a world of difference between success and failure, joy and sorrow, peace and chaos, even life or death. If you make the right choice, that will lead to the right destination. But if you make the wrong choice, that would lead to the wrong destination. In fact, we all will face these three C's, I call them, of life, choices, challenges, and consequences. The choices you make can have a lasting effect on your ministry, upon your marriage and your family. The decisions you make will, to a great extent, affect your level of happiness. And God will show us the choice to make, but it is still up to us to act 
on that choice. We cast the deciding vote of what we do. We make our choices and our choices, watch this, our choices will make us in the end. Today, God's asking us to let go of the regrets of the past, the, the emotional pain and the choices we made in the past that we now look back with regret. He's asking us not to carry those over into today. Yesterday's mistakes are past. Yesterday's hurts and yesterday's failures are past. Today is a new day. We must never allow our past to put us in prison and prevent us from fulfilling our glorious destiny in God. I know someone that constantly refers back to a, a more glorious day, what I shouldn't have done, what I could have done, what I didn't do. Today, you can turn a new leaf and face the future with, with a great hope in God. Every new day is a new beginning. Every new day offers new hope. Every new day is a new opportunity. The Bible says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Hallelujah. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And it is a beautiful day indeed. Yet many of us are not able to wake up to a new day and see its beauty and possibilities. All because we let our regrets, our hurts, our disappointments from the past cloud our eyes to see what God wants to do with us today. Here's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 43, 18, quote, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Verse 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That is the promise of God for the child of God. God wants us to be washed clean from our mistakes of our past. Everybody makes mistakes. He wants us to learn and grow from them and move forward from past regrets. God wants us to live a whole new life in spite of our mistakes. Hallelujah. He knows all that we have been through and are still going through, but he does not want us to live in the past. Come on, somebody. God has great things for us now and in the future, but we will not receive them if we continue to allow what has happened to us in the past to cloud our minds and hinder our focus on the future. Today is the day that God has given to us. I will be, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Every minute you spend regretting that choice that you did or didn't make is a moment that you could be making new choices. Hallelujah. One that could change your life for the better. And we must choose to live uh, in a way that puts the past in our rearview mirror. It should put it behind us and choose to focus on your future. Isn't that what Paul says in Philippians 3? Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, he said, or, or achieved anything great. But one thing I do, forgetting those things are which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before me, I press forward for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so uh, I present to you some choices. The first one I ask you to do is choose repentance. If you haven't repented today, you, you should repent today. Repentance means a change of mind, a change of heart. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, get to know him. Ask him to come into your heart. Stop doing the things that you're doing that you know he wouldn't like. And beg for forgiveness. Number two, receive God's forgiveness. He's waiting to forgive you, waiting to cleanse you and restore you. I read you the scriptures. And God will release you from the shame of your past, the regrets of your past, the pain of your past, from the mistakes of your past. And so you don't carry them around with you anymore. God wants to wipe your slate clean. And God can, and you can, receive God's forgiveness today. Number three, Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. We all have made mistakes. 
And, and, and many times God has already forgiven us, but we can't forgive ourselves. If God has forgiven you, you, you then need to forgive yourself. Refuse to let your mind dwell on that which has already been forgiven by God. You're worthy of love. You are forgiven. So forgive yourself. Next, you can silence the devil that is whispering in your ear. <laughs> you know, uh, he, he loves to remind us of our past mistakes and our failures. Revelation 12 says, but, but you, you can silence him. The Bible says, and they overcame the dragon by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. In other words, we must use the weapon of the blood of the lamb. That's what Jesus did. And the word of our testimony. That's what we do in order to overcome the temptations of the devil. Paul tells us, don't focus on the past. Focus on the future. Number six, turn regrets into thanksgiving. First Thessalonians 5.18, in everything the Bible says, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, the good and the bad thing. And, and, and if you've got bad things chasing you down, the Bible says, let them go. When you, when you are tempted to fall into a pit of regret, Turn that into worship, praise, and thanksgiving to the Lord. And watch how the Lord will turn that around. And of course, we need to get back up. Number seven, Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Amen. No matter how much you have failed, God's word says that you were created for good work. So get back up. Amen. You were created for good works. Amen. And we read in James 4, 13, it says, come now, you who say today for tomorrow, we will do such and such and in such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit. Verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then washes away, vanishes away. There are a lot of people living in the past. I ask you, my brother, my sister, don't do that. These people are always looking back, haunted by what they did wrong years ago. And it, they, they, they are stuck. It's like, uh, it's like a car that's dro driven into some mud and the, the tires keep turning and they're not moving forward. That's what regret is like. Don't focus on regrets. Live for today. Live for the moment and focus on your future. God has a race marked out for you. He wants you to run this race. Keep focus on the goal ahead. Amen. Going back to Philippians 3, I, I don't think I've accomplished a lot, Paul says. But he says, I press towards the future for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's forgetting everything that's behind, right? And so we have a choice today. Everyone is presented with an opportunity to turn their lives around, come to God, and it will be a tragedy to miss heaven if you are focused so much on your past that you miss heaven. In heaven, we are told we will never again know regrets. We will never again know pain or sorrow or tears. Read Revelation 21.4. It says, quote, and God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. The former things have passed away. Everything that I'm telling you is in the Bible. And so hell is the, hop, the opposite of heaven. It is a place of punishment and full of regret. The loudest cry in hell would be, I wish I had known. Right. Or had I known, I would have stopped sinning. Or had I known, I would have turned to God. Right. Hell will be a scene of unending regrets, agony, and torment. But today, uh, the door of salvation is still wide open. Uh, when you die in your sin, the door will be closed. 
But today, right now, the door is open. We have an opportunity to repent, turn to the Lord. Don't, don't allow the door to close on you. When you stand before God on the day of judgment and your name is not in that book of life, you will certainly regret that choice. So, so what's next? Start by praising the Lord for his goodness and provision and mercy to you, towards you and your family. Next, repent of all your sins, known and unknown. Ask the Lord to forgive you of those sins and determine in your heart. That's what true, true repentance is. Determine in your heart that you will put them behind you and never go back and pick them up. Follow the Acts 2.38 plan of salvation. Consent to water baptism by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ. Put on Christ, the Bible says. And the Lord promises you that he will fill you with his Holy Spirit. Then ask the Lord to help you to think straight, walk straight, talk right. Make good decisions looking forward to Jesus. Determine to cease your evil actions. Push away the things that used to trip you up. Ask the Holy Spirit to uproot every evil thing that fights against your desire to advance in God. Amen. Ask God to let the choices you make be guided by his word. And then finish your prayer by praising him again and thanking him for answering your prayers. Be, be, be focused on your calling. If you're not focused on your calling, if God called you to be a minister, an evangelist, a teacher, a Sunday school teacher, be focused on your calling and let that motivate you towards good works in God. And change your attitude. Don't go back to the past. Let the past be the past. Take the instructions of Paul, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth forward unto those things which are before me. Paul says, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Praise God. That's all I have for you tonight. I uh, sincerely hope that you um, enjoyed the presentation, the teaching, the preaching. I sincerely hope that you got something for, from it. 